Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua from Bloomberg TV, and I'm delighted to be speaking to Ivan Glassenberg. He's the chief executive of Glencore. Ivan, thank you for joining us. We'll talk about the energy transition and some of the things that Glencore is doing. But first, I need to ask you about the commodity prices. Do you see the rally that we've seen in commodities actually continuing? Yeah, thanks, Francine. I do, because uh, you got the big infrastructure spend, uh, which is occurring in uh, China at the moment. It started uh, post early when the COVID crisis hit and the Chinese got out of the problems. They started spending on infrastructure and pushing the infrastructure fiscal spending, and that started the rise of commodity prices. You also had a few disruptions around the world in certain commodities uh, because of the COVID, and that tightened up supply, and that uh, allowed the commodities to push up to where they are today. You also have infrastructure in picking up in various parts of the world, but we do see mm -hmm. it coming in the United States when eventually they pass the infrastructure bill, and uh, the speculation of commodity prices picking up on the back of that will start driving them up. So I think the uh, pure underlying demand supply fundamentals are putting commodity prices to the levels where they are, I know recently the Chinese have tried to push it down to bring it back to uh, lower levels. I think that's a short-term game uh, because the underlying fundamentals will keep it at these levels. But so, so how much can they actually try and talk it down, China? Well, they're not trying to talk it down. They're taking uh, some material from the strategic stockpiles and putting that in the market. Now, how big the stockpiles are, uh, we don't know exactly, but they can do it for a while, but eventually they've got to restock the strategic stockpile. They can't keep it at these low levels, so they'll come back into the market. So I think it's a short-term uh, phase. I'm short-term, like a couple of months? Are we, are we actually at the start of some kind of super cycle, but a super cycle that's very different from last time around? Yeah, well, what was long? We've had two sort of super cycles, you can say. In 2002, we had the Chinese uh, coming into the market where you had the big push on commodities. The world wasn't ready for that amount of demand, and you had commodity prices rise considerably. Then the world sort of caught up a bit, but then you had the 2008 uh, financial crisis pushed down commodity prices. Chinese came in big with infrastructure spend in 2009. That kept it strong. Unfortunately, then the mining industry got uh, the usual situation where they started producing too much, increased production, opened up new, new mines, and started producing uh, more. That pushed it down, and you had the 2015 uh, uh, commodity price drop. Now we uh, it started looking better until COVID. COVID pushed it down, as we said, and now we got the rise with the infrastructure spending occurring in many places around the world. Is this a super cycle? I don't know if you want to call it a super cycle, but I do believe commodity prices will stay strong for a long while longer. And I think when the American infrastructure plan comes into fruition and the actual shovel ready, uh, how many shovel ready projects they have, I don't know, but let's assume it will take them 18 months to get going. Uh, you will push a commodity price will stay high for a long time. You will have both parts of the world pushing infrastructure. You'll have the Chinese continuing with their infrastructure plan they still got to urbanize uh, a few hundred million people, and you have the United States kicking in, uh, upgrading their infrastructure. Demand for commodities will stay for a long time. Can supply meet that I demand? Well, that's another debate. How quick the mining industry can increase and bring new projects on, but that's a lengthy debate. New projects, I think, are going to take longer this time around. There aren't many projects around the world. We've developed most of the easy projects. We now got to go into the more difficult regions of the world where there isn't infrastructure, harder political environment, and I think the mining industry is not ready uh, to add massive new tons to the market. But with the new green energy besides the infrastructure and all the green energy demand that we'll talk about later, um, I believe uh, the mining industry is going to struggle to keep pace. So, Ivan, is a surge, for example, in coal prices, which currently are at around a 10-year high, a warning sign, what could happen, for example, in oil and gas with the energy transition now that companies just aren't investing enough, which goes to what you're saying? Yeah, that's clearly. You've seen, I think, uh, thermal coal is leading, uh, is a perfect example. The world has said we want to reduce the amount of thermal coal production. Uh, mining companies definitely are not investing in more thermal coal mines. Uh, a lot of the mining companies are even getting rid of their thermal coal mines. Uh, we ourselves, we said we will run down our thermal coal mines over time, and we said we will par uh, follow the Paris uh, Agreement, whereby we reduce uh, by 2035. Uh, we're talking about 40% there, and by 2050, we will run down most of our coal mines. 
So what you are having is supply being disrupted, no new mm -hmm. supply coming into the thermal coal uh, market. However, demand is still there. Now we can, we'll talk, we can talk about the green energy and how we're going to switch from fossil fuels to renewables and how quick we can do that. But right now, there are coal-fired stations around the world, especially in Asia, which continue. There are still new coal-fired stations being built around the world as much as we don't want that to happen. But uh, the uh, developing countries, coal is still the cheapest form of energy uh, electricity supply, and the uh, coal-fired stations will continue. But if you are cutting supply and seaborne market is about 950 million tons and you reduce that and that continues reducing, you will have coal at these high levels. And today you have Australian coal at $130, South African coal at $120. That's what happens when you cut supply and you haven't find a solution for demand. I, I think in your previous panel, I was listening there, that's the situation. Cut fossil fuels, that's fine, but we've got to make sure renewables can fill their space and we don't have a gap. And if a gap is going to be there, you're going to have higher commodity prices. How challenging, Ivan, given what you've just explained, do you think the energy transition will be? And, and I mean, I know you believe that it's challenging, but why? Is it the lack of metals that actually are used or is it uh, some of the things that governments are not looking at? Yeah, look, the energy transition, we today, what? We've got to substitute fossil fuels, whether we're talking about coal, oil, gas, and we've got to reduce that by the year 2050. And mm -hmm. we're talking about replacing, that supplies 80% of the world's energy demand today. So, you know, if you've got to do that, we still got to grow the amount of energy. By 2050, you've got to produce two and a half times more energy the world's going to need. You still have about 800 million people in the world who still don't have electricity. We've got to supply them electricity. You still have about 2.6 billion people in the world that still don't have clean cooking. So a lot of new energy has to be supplied to the world. Now, if we're going to take that renewable, today the world uh, produces around about 3,000 gigawatts of renewable energy. We've got to take that up by the two year 2050 to 26,500 gigawatts of energy, of uh, renewable. What does that mean? We've got to produce 20 times the amount of solar energy than we're producing today. 11 times the amount of uh, wind turbines, and we talk about electric vehicles. We say we want to produce by the year 2030 to follow this energy transition, around about 55 million vehicles uh, per year being produced. Today, what are we? That's 18 times the amount of electric that, vehicles we're producing. Ivan, are you? Are you telling me that it's uh, that's almost impossible that we achieve those targets, or you're saying you know we can achieve them if we do this today, but it will be difficult? <laughs> I don't know if we can achieve them. Can we switch over to that amount of wind and solar in that amount of time? I don't know. But let's assume we can, and we can fill the gap of uh, fossil fuels with this wind and solar. The question is, do we have the metals to supply it? To give you an example, copper today, we produce, uh, the world consumes 30 million tons of copper. By the year 2050, following this trajectory, we've got to produce 60 uh, uh, million tons of copper per year. Now, if you look right. at that, that means we've got to grow and increase copper supply by a million tons per year. If you look at historical past 10 years, we've only increased 500,000 tons per year. Do we have the projects to add a million tons of copper per year? I don't think so. I think that's going to be extremely difficult. Take the same if you take nickel. Today we produce 2.5 million tons of nickel. We've got to grow to 9.2 million tons of nickel. We've got to produce an extra 200. Uh, 50,000 tons of nickel per year. We've only but been so, growing at about 100,000 tons of nickel. But Same Ivan, goes for cobalt. But so if we're not able to actually meet the forecast, what does the industry do about it? Is there anything that they can do now to make sure that they grow at least at a pace which is adequate to keep up with some of the things that you're talking about? Look, the mining industry is going to look at it intensely. Uh, we do see the Chinese who are focusing on this, and we see them trying to increase production in these various commodities. They were forced to see this, and they've been looking at this over the last 10 years at least. We've seen the Chinese have been increasing uh, nickel production in Indonesia uh, rampantly. We see uh, nickel pig iron be in Indonesia. I think today they're producing around about 800,000 tons. That comes from a very low level. So there the Chinese have seen it. We see it in the DRC. If we talk copper and cobalt, the Chinese are pushing copper and cobalt production in the DRC. Um, and I think they're seeing it. Us, the mining industry, we're trying to grow and we're trying to increase projects. But as I said earlier, projects are in the more difficult regions, not the easy projects. And actually, the world does the easy projects first, the difficult ones later. We're in that stage now in the difficult projects. We're going to countries with lack of infrastructure. 
We're going to new countries uh, in a difficult political uh, environment, not so easy. So I think the world's going to struggle to catch up. And that's where it's going to be the thing. What we're doing is we want to say we want to cut the supply of fossil fuels and we, got to, and we must find the solution. Right. Uh, and that's going to be you cutting it, but we don't have the solution yet. So you've got to try and get the two to balance. Can we do it? That's going to be the test. Okay, whose job is it to do it? So is it private companies? Is it public companies? Is it governments? Is it someone else? I think it's a mixture of everyone, yeah. I mean, I think it's got to be governments. If governments say we've got to have green energy and we've got to move towards the green energy and we've got to get rid of fossil fuels, what is the, who's going to supply it? Can private industry do it? And private industry, of course, will push because we know that's mm -hmm. going to create higher commodity prices. That's what we want, and we're going to try grow. But provided we, you know, the uh, demand is there, the demand will be there. But do we have the projects to do it? If we don't, then yes, like China, the government is pushing their companies to grow supply. We see it. We're going to see it in iron ore shortly. Uh, you have Guinea, where the Chinese are pushing, uh, you know, the, their companies to go produce more iron ore in Guinea. So it's going to be a push from governments to make sure with, that their private industries, their private companies are investing and in growing the supply of these important commodities for the new green energy future. Electric vehicles, you're going to have to produce a lot more nickel, a lot more cobalt, a lot more copper. Can we get it if we are going to total electric vehicles? And as I said, by 2030, we're talking 55 million electric vehicles a year. That's a lot of copper, nickel, and cobalt we're going to have to produce. Can we get it forward. And it's uh, going to be a concerted effort, I think, of both government and private industry. Evan, you're considered one of the fiercest chief executives of uh, this generation. Really? So what, as you're about to step down, what's been the biggest mistake in your career, apart from not giving enough TV interviews? <laughs> Look, we all make mistakes. There's certain investments that haven't turned out as we would have liked them, uh, but that's life. We live with that. Uh, I think the most important thing that I've tried to do in the industry is to ensure that we don't oversupply the industry. And we try to do that here at Glencore, uh, reduce supply when we felt the market didn't need it. Um, but yeah, we've had some problematic assets around the world, difficult regions we've operated in. Some didn't turn out great. So I think like any CEO, you've got some bad projects didn't turn out. But overall, I think we uh, it turned out great. I think the company's done great. Uh, we have a great set of commodities, and we're very fortunate that we got the right set of commodities for exactly what we've been talking about. We got the commodities that feed this new uh, uh, green energy. We have cobalt, we have copper, we have nickel, we have zinc. These are the important commodities for the new energy future. So that's what we have pretty happy about here at Glencore.